Uh, every time you open the Bible, you hear from God. You know, and uh, God's word is true, and uh, every man's a liar. And, uh, you know, if you want to know the truth, you go to God's word. And uh, if you're not in God's word, uh, you're going to be deceived. The Bible says many are deceived in the last days, and it's because they don't open the Bible and read it. Um, Brother Stewart was talking the other day about Proverbs and how great Proverbs is. You know, if you can only, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to limit your reading, I don't, I don't suggest you ever limit your reading. But if you're going to limit, limit your reading, if you could read one chapter a day in Proverbs, there's one for every day of the week. If you would just do that constantly through a year, um, the wisdom that you would glean, especially young people, the wisdom that you could glean from the book of Proverbs, uh, you can't put a price tag on that. Uh, but this morning we're, we're, we're uh, in Luke chapter 14. I want to read verse 18 and 19 for our text. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I, I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow before you this morning, Father. We thank you, Lord for the opportunity, Lord, to be here. Lord, how wonderful a day you've created. Lord, we, we, will, we will rejoice and be glad in this day. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity and the freedom that we have here to come open the Bible together, that we can sing praises to you together. Lord, that we can glorify your name without fear uh, right now of persecution, Father. And help us, Lord, as we have this freedom that we have in our country, Lord, to use it wisely, Lord, for it is a special gift from God. Help us, Lord, to be ready. Lord, when you call to follow you, help us, Lord, not to make excuse why we can't do something for your service. Lord, there's so many today who make excuses why they can't do something for you. But, Lord, there's no good excuse. Help us, Lord, when you call us to do all that you would ask us to do. And, Lord, to be ready and willing and wanting to be used of our, our master, which is Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we just pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The title of the message this morning is, I have bought something and cannot come. I have bought something and cannot come. And I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about finances. And I know you talk about people's money or you talk politics or religion, that some people get a little put off that you shouldn't go into that area of speech. But I want to tell you something. The greatest book ever written on finances is the book that we have here, the King James Bible. And it speaks on finances. Uh, and it talks about finances. And it's shame on me if I would not talk about financial issues uh, from the pulpit. Now, there are many churches today who cannot speak of finances because because they're, uh, they're in debt. Uh, there are many pastors today who can't speak on finances because they're in debt. There are many people out there today who can't talk about finances because they've made wrong choices uh, in, in their congregations and in their life. And, and they're indebted to someone, so they cannot talk about finances. But shame on us if we cannot talk about finances. Uh, we're going to this morning. Uh, one of the most amazing verses in the Bible to me is Matthew 4.20. It says in Matthew 4.20, And they straightway left their nets and followed him. I want you to think about that for a moment this morning. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. You know, when Jesus was passing by, Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw some fishermen who had their nets in their hands, and he called out to them and he said, follow me. If I can put my own words, he said, follow me, boys. And those boys had a net in their hand. They dropped the net as soon as he asked them, and they followed him, and they went wherever he went, and they did whatever he told them to do, and they were ready at a moment's notice to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We need some young people today who will drop whatever's in their hands, whether it be a net or whether it be something else in their hands, whatever it is, when Jesus calls you, I don't care what it is, it isn't worth more than the call of Jesus Christ. We should be willing to let go of whatever's in our hand and say, yes, Lord, lead for I will follow. I'm one of your sheep. I've heard your voice and I'm going to follow you wherever you would take me. I want to do whatever you want me to do for my life because I know that your purpose for my life is greater than my purpose for my life. Amen. We need some people this morning, we need some young people, we need some elderly people who are willing and able to follow Jesus when he calls. Listen to this, Matthew 4, 18 through 22, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed, and followed him. Why did Jesus call these lowly fishermen? Did you ever ask yourself, why would Jesus call these lowly fishermen? We think often that Jesus didn't call others. Like Jesus only called 12 people. Uh, like he only looked and, and went out and said, follow me to 12 people. And we think in our mind, he only called these 12 people. But no, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible say, I, think, I think Jesus went everywhere he went. I think he was calling people to follow him. I think today Jesus is calling people to follow him. I think people get few, confused because yet Jesus chose 12 disciples, but there's a difference between choosing and calling. God says, if I, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. In other words, I call all people to follow me everywhere. But the Bible also says many are called, but few are chosen. Listen, uh, God has called you. You go, well, I, don't, I haven't heard God call me. God has called you. Every person, God has called you. If you heard the name of Jesus Christ, if you've heard the gospel, God has called you to drop what you're doing, whatever's in your hand that's important to you, drop that right now and follow Jesus Christ. But the Bible says many are called and few are chosen. It's not that God only chose the 12. It's that the 12 were the only ones who responded to the call. We have to understand that, listen, God has called us to be chosen. All we have to do is respond to the call, drop what's in our hands, and follow Jesus. How many of us are willing to drop what's in our hands? How many of us can drop what's in our hands and follow Jesus? That's what the message is on this morning. How many of us can drop what's in our hands and follow Jesus Christ? There are literally hundreds, thousands, I suppose millions of excuses. None of them any good. But, but countless number of excuses why people do not follow Jesus... You know, and I'm going to only focus on one this morning. I'm not going to focus on, 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 on hundreds or thousands or millions of different excuses why people don't drop what's in their hands and follow Jesus. I'm only going to focus on one for the most part. Maybe at the end we might get to a different one. But for the most part, I'm going to focus on one, and that is financial reasons why people do not follow Jesus Christ. Specifically, debt. Specifically, uh, voluntary slavery is what I'll call it. I bought something and I cannot come. That's the title of the message. I bought something and I cannot come. You know, here, here, was a, here was a certain man. Here was a certain king who made a great feast. We'll call it a wedding feast. And he bid them to come to his wedding. And he bid them to come to his dinner. And he went and he called the supposed rich of the world. And he said, why don't you come to my dinner? And they said, oh, I bought something. I cannot come. Think about that for a moment. How sad that is. To miss the wedding supper of the Lamb because you bought something and you cannot come. Luke 14, 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. There are people who have a $600 cell phone that don't have $600 in the bank. And they're making payments on the cell phone. 41.2% of all households, 41.2% of all households carry some sort of credit card debt. The average credit card debt for a household is over $6,800. The average, the average person that walking around has a credit card in the back of their pocket or maybe in their purse. And, and on that is $6,800 worth of debt. Total U.S. credit card debt is $444 billion. There are people who are not here this morning because they owe money to someone and they have to go to their job instead of come to church. 54% of college attendees have student loan debt. The average amount of student loan debt borrowed is over $46,000. Total U.S. student loan debt is $1.5 trillion. Total owed by average U.S. householders with a mortgage is over $189,000. Total U.S. household debt. Listen to this. Total U.S. household debt is $13.95 trillion. Or, you know, no wonder nobody's talking about the deficit. 
No wonder nobody's talking about the deficit that we have in, in 2020 that's $1.08 trillion when the total household debt of Americans is $13.95 trillion. That would, you know, to talk about it and not be a hypocrite, you can't be in a ditch and tell somebody else that they're in a, in a ditch that's smaller than your ditch. Amen? Nobody wants to talk about it when they're in a ditch and they see somebody else in a ditch that's not deep, as deep as theirs. They're not going to talk about that guy because they can't. Amen? Churches aren't preaching on it. They've mortgaged their building. They've mortgaged everything they have. And they're preaching to people with not the intent of preaching the gospel, but tickling their ears so that the offering plate gets tinkled. And they hear the droppings of the money in the offering plate so they can keep paying the monthly payments so that they don't run out of money, so they don't get kicked out of their building. The best thing that would happen to most churches is if they got kicked out of their building. Amen? Maybe if they got kicked out of their building, they would wake up and say, wow, we've been doing this all wrong. We need to go out of the church and win the lost. Amen? Amen? Amen. That might be the best thing that would happen to most churches. Listen, people would stop paying and they'd go out in the, in the highways and the byways and they'd start compelling people to come in. Not, to, the, not to, to, to an empty dead house, but to a lively people full of the Holy Spirit. $13.95 trillion is the total U.S. debt for a household. Jesus walking by saith to them, follow me. I bought something and I cannot come. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And others said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I want to follow you. Can you wait maybe 60 months? Can you wait maybe 66 months? Can you wait maybe 72 months? Because I've got a car loan, and after I get my car loan paid off, uh, we're just talking five, five and a half, six years. After I get that paid off, I would love to follow you, but because the bank won't drop my loan, I can't drop my net. I have to follow the bank's net because they have me for 60, 66, 72 months. And I know you call me and I want to follow you, but I can't follow you right now. I've got obligations. Jesus, I want to follow you. Could you wait maybe 21 years? It takes an average of 21 years to pay off student loan debts. Can you wait 21 years to get a piece of paper that says you're smart? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna put yourself on a pedestal for 21 years, get a piece of paper that says you're smart, and be indebted for 21 years. You, Jesus, can you wait for me for 21 years? I want to serve you, and I want to follow you today, but i got 21 years of debt to pay before I can follow you. But I'm smart enough. Once, once I get this paid off, I'm smart enough to follow you. Jesus, can you wait 30 years? I bought a really nice house. <laughs> You should see it. I think these numbers are low. $189,000 with a mortgage, I think that's probably low. But $189,000 buys a pretty nice house. Lord, I know you called me, but I've got this net in my hand. It's called a mortgage, and, and I can't drop the net as long as the bank doesn't drop the loan. Will you just wait for me for 30 years? I want to come follow you. I'm not getting any amens on this sermon. <laughs> Amen. 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 You know that all the verses of the teachings of Jesus in the Bible, one in every six is about money? You didn't know that. 16% of what Jesus spoke about was about money issues. I wonder why. Follow me. Can you wait for me to pay off my debt? I've just bought something and I cannot come. The Old Testament in Proverbs states, 20, in verse, Proverbs 22, 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I was born free. You were born free. 
Today in America, almost everyone is born free. I don't know anyone in America who's not born free. We've all read about the atrocities in the past, and even, even today in distant countries, we read about the horrible, the horrible fact that there is, there is places even today where one human being owns another human being. How horrible that is. Christianity has, true Christianity has always fought against that. You look back at abolitionists and, and, and the most, the, some of the greatest abolitionists were Christians who read the Bible and understood one man should not own another man because of the color of his sin, skin or because he was born, that, you know, born in, a, in a poor family and they just take someone and make him a slave. I can't imagine. It's forced on so many. They were bought and sold like property, having done nothing wrong, born into slavery. Born in Africa, Phyllis Wheatley was captured and sold into slavery as a child. I can't imagine. She wrote a poem. Here's, part of, here's a portion of it. Should you, my Lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung? Whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood? I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. What pains excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breasts. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such was my case, and can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. You know, one of the first verses of this part of this poem was, Wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung. You know, we can't imagine being a slave, but, but I can't imagine one thing. If I had been born a slave, if I had been owned by someone, I can imagine that every waking moment that I would ever have in my life would be about freedom. I can imagine the, the anger that I would have toward my master who owned me and maybe mistreated me or made me do things that I did not want to do. And I can imagine waking up thinking freedom. How can I escape this man? How can I escape this man who oppresses me? How can I escape this man who puts me down? How can I escape this man that, that orders every moment of my day? How can I escape this person? And I can imagine wanting to be free. Amen? And I can imagine planning on being free. And I can imagine trying and trying to figure out a way to escape and gain my freedom. I can imagine that. You can have pity and empathy really easily for someone who was born into slavery. For someone who was taken from their home like this woman as a girl was stolen from her family and made a slave. You can have, it's easy to have empathy for that person. We went through the Holocaust Museum when we were in Israel. And your heart breaks over what one person did to another person. And as you go through, as you go through a, a museum about slavery, your heart can break that one man would be so cruel as to want to own another person and to put them down and to hurt them and to force them into labor. But you know what's hard to have pity on? It's someone who would sell themselves. It's awfully hard to have pity on someone who would sell themselves. Can you imagine? The Bible says, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrow is servant to the lender. Can you imagine putting yourself up on the auction block? Think about that for a moment. No one's forcing you. You jump up on the auction block and say, who will give me 20? Who will give me 30? Who will give me 40? For 60 months. For 66 months. For 72 months. Who will give me $30,000? I'll give you 20 years. $30,000, I'll give you 20 years of my life if you'll give me a piece of paper that says I'm smart. That doesn't sound very smart. Amen? Amen. Listen, we live in a country where there's more information that's ever been in the history of the world. If you want education, you can get education and you don't have to sell yourself to get it. Amen. There's nothing, there's, no, almost, there's literally almost nothing you can learn about that isn't out there almost for free. But we have people who will jump up on the auction block and say, who give me $30,000? I'll give you 20 years of my life to pay this off. And then today we have candidates, like, we have candidates right now saying, I'll pay off your student loan debt. Look, we have to have pity on these people. They didn't know what they were getting into when they sold their self and they signed the contract. Listen, let me tell you something, young people. When you sign a contract and it says you're going to pay that back, you understand you are going to pay that back. That's your debt. You took it upon yourself, and you should not expect anyone else to take that debt from you. Amen? Amen? 
Listen, when we take on a responsibility, your word should be your bond. I bought things before on credit. The first car I ever bought, man, I, I looked at the payment and I, and I was always taught, listen, the Bible tells us, owe no man. The Bible tells us uh, the borrow, borrower is servant to the lender. And man, when I signed that paper, I knew I could afford that payment. I looked at that payment, that car payment, 200 some dollars, and I knew I could afford that payment. I knew what my budget was, and I knew that first month I could afford that payment. But you know what? The first month comes and you pay the payment. Second month comes, you pay the payment. Third month comes, you pay the payment. A year goes by, you made the payment. It keeps on coming. <laughs> it doesn't stop. If it says 60 months, it means five years. If it says 66 months, it means five and a half years. You got to make that payment every month, every time on time. And I was always taught, listen, if you have a debt, you pay it before you eat. That'll make you serious about your debts. Amen? Amen? It's good advice. I can't imagine putting myself up in the auction block for 30 years. Yet my first house loan was a 30 year loan. What did I say? I said, you know what? All I'm willing to work for 30 years for this money so I can have something right now. It's, it's normal. This is normal society. This is what we do. We want what we want when we want it, and we're willing to sign our name and say, I'll put myself on the auction block for 30 years so I can have that house right now. Amen? Amen? When you buy a house, young people, count the cost. When you buy anything, count the cost. Realize when you sign that piece of paper, the borrower is servant to the lender. And when you sign that, you're going to serve them for however long the term is until that loan is paid off. And you sign the paper, and you get the house, or you get the car, or you get the college degree, and Jesus walks over and says, follow me. I can't follow you. I bought something. Would you wait for me? I bought something and I cannot come. The first said I bought a piece of ground. The second said I bought five yoke of oxen. These people didn't listen to the Bible. Or they heard it and they didn't obey it. The Bible, which by the way gives us perfect counsel every time. In other words, the, the God, God says, let God, the Bible says, let God be true in every man a liar. So when you go and you say, well, this is just the normal thing that everybody does. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? The rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. There are people who aren't church this morning. Because they are a servant to the lender. Someone has lent them some money, whether it's for a car or a cell phone or some bill, and the work says, we need you to come in on Sunday. And they say, yes, master. And they go in on Sunday, and they work on Sunday, and they work on Monday, and they work on Tuesday, and they work whatever day the owner says they're going to work, they work, and they don't have the option to drop their net and follow Jesus. They don't have the option to drop their net and follow something else. They don't have the option to drop their net and do anything else because they have to be doing what their master says when their master says to do it. Amen? Amen. This is why the left loves welfare. This is, why the, this is why the Democratic Party is offering people free welfare, uh, free college, all this stuff for free because, listen, if you become dependent on someone else handing you a paycheck, then you'll do whatever they want you to do, and you'll vote however you want, they want you to vote, and they'll, they'll do whatever you want. That's why churches who sold out wanting money more than to preach the power and the, and, and the, and the tr true word of God have sold out, and they are a servant to those who are giving them stuff. Amen. Here's what the Bible says, and the Bible gives perfect counsel. Amen. I know you all love me. <laughs> I know I can preach whatever, whatever the Bible says I can preach here, and I have no, I have no fear Amen. that any of you will leave. Because my dad who came before me preached the truth, and all the people who didn't want to hear the truth left already. <laughs> Amen? 
Listen, my dad, my dad was on, on the Bible plan before Dave Ramsey was ever a thing. <laughs> Before he, 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 before he went into bankruptcy, my dad was living the right life, owing no man, paying his debts, and doing what needed to be done because he lived by the Bible. Amen? Amen? And I'm for Dave Ramsey. I'm for what he, what he promotes, which is, which is living without debt. But, he, but, but there, 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 listen, young people, in life there are two examples, and both of them can be very good. One, you watch somebody that preaches about the family, and they have a messed up family. Are you going to listen to that person? You, you listen to somebody who preaches about debt, and they've got all kinds of debt. You're going to listen to that person. Some people learn by making mistakes, and some people learn because they did it right the first time. I'd rather listen to the guy that did it right the first time and didn't make the mistake, but I will listen to someone who's messed up and says, listen, I've messed up, and I'm trying to tell you how to do it right. Yes. Both of them can give sound advice, but don't listen to the guy who's messed up, messing up, still messing up, and telling you to go the wrong direction. Okay? The Word of God never gives us wrong direction. The Word of God says do it right the first time and it will save you so much heartache in life. The Bible says the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. And in Deuteronomy 15, verse 6, in Deuteronomy 28, 12, he says, Listen, Israel, you're my people. And as my people, I want you to lend and not borrow because I want you to be the one that lends to people so people are serving you and you're not serving other people. For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as he promised thee and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou, shalt, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Amen? So I think if I can understand what the Bible's saying when he talks to his people, which is Israel and which is every Christian, when God talks about money, he says, listen, I want you to lend money, but I don't want you to borrow money. Because the borrower is servant to the lender and the rich ruleth over the poor in this life. Romans 3.8 says, owe no man anything. Does that talk about money? We can all shake our head. Does that talk about other things? Favors? Amen. Amen? Is that talking about handshakes in private closets saying, I'll do this and you do that? Is it talking about that? It is talking about that. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. In other words, you treat others the way you want to be treated in every aspect of life. Don't borrow from someone. You can loan to them, but don't borrow from them. If somebody offers you a gift, you don't take it. You offer gifts, but you don't take them. The word loan appears in the Bible one time. Talks about, it talks about borrowing. One time, L-O-A-N, one time. You can look it up. It's the only time it appears in the Bible. Are you interested to know what it says? I'm always interested when the Bible says one thing one time. I'm interested when it repeats things, too. I'm interested in all the Bible has to say. The, loan, the word loan appears one time in the Bible, and that's it. And it's where a wise woman, a very wise woman, loaned something out. She gave a loan, but she was wise. This wasn't a foolish woman. She loaned to God. You want to loan something? Loan to God. Amen? Because God will pay back his loan quickly and with interest. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Young people, you want, to, you, want to, you, want to, you want to you want to be a loaner, not a borrower. We need to be more like Hannah. Who was who loaned to God. Listen, we're living in the last days. That's why I preach a message like this. It's time to stop borrowing from rich people who make us servants. And what do we get in return? Cheap junk from China. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You might, you, might get, you, might get, you might get some really good quality stuff from America. I don't know. Or from other pl some other place. But when you are borrowing money, you're saying, I want this physical possession so badly that I'm willing to put myself on the auction block so that I can have this physical possession that's going to tie me up for months or years so that I can have this physical possession right now. What does the Bible say about patience? It's a virtue. Do we hear that taught a lot? No. No. Why? Because we live in a society that says it's okay to borrow because if you don't have the money for this, you need to borrow the money so that you have the money for it. The Bible says, oh, no man. The Bible says the, 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 the borrower is servant to the lender. The Bible says, I want you to lend but not borrow.
Let's be like Hannah, who loaned to God. You cannot loan to God for the glory of God and end, and end in disappointment. And I want you to hear something, okay? This is not, this is not health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, okay? Where you, you give the church $5 and God's going to give you back $10. It doesn't work that way. But I want to tell you something. Even those charlatans sometimes, uh, there are people out there who hear them and they really love God and they give from their heart to the work of God for the glory of God. And God does bless those people with more than they gave. The woman who cast in her mites, all that she had, all of her living. And Jesus said, listen, see what she did? Everywhere the gospel's preached, she's going to be heard about. Man, that was the best money ever spent. Amen. Amen? Amen? You loan something to God, he will give you back. And he'll give you back quickly with interest. Or maybe it'll take some time, but it'll be with interest. And it'll be worth whatever you gave him. It'll be worth giving up for God. There's nothing you can give God that isn't worth giving up for him. Hannah loaned God one son. 1 Samuel 2, 21. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And she and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Listen, listen, everything we have of value comes from God. Follow me on this. I want to show you something on this. Okay, listen up right now. Hannah loaned God what God gave her. Amen? Amen. Hannah loaned God her son. Where did she get her son from? God. Like Abraham before her, I will give my only son, the thing that I want more than anything else, Abraham said. I, I've wanted a son, the son of promise. I've wanted the son Isaac more than anything I've ever wanted in my life. Hannah was so distraught that she wanted a son. And she prayed to God and said, I'll give him back to you. I want him so much, I'll just give him right back to you. I'll, I'll, I'll loan him back to you. And Hannah gave her son. She wasn't lying. She was honest with God. God gave her a son. She gave him right back to God. Abraham gave Isaac to God and said, here, I'll loan him to you. And God says, listen, if I can trust you with a little, I can trust you with a lot. Amen. All through the Bible, it says, you know what? Those who I can trust with a little bit, I can trust with a lot. And Hannah, uh, after Hannah gave uh, God her son and loaned God her son, he gave Hannah two daughters and three sons. And what did he give Abraham? Seed as the stars of heaven for multitude. Amen? Amen? Didn't they get you a little excited? Like, maybe I want to give something to God? What, what would I give to God and understand, listen, if I give it to God for the glory of God, I'll never be disappointed in what I've given God because he'll always outdo me. Amen? Always. The older people who are here, I do. I, you know, I'll separate sometimes. I'll separate the older from the younger when I preach. You, you know I do that. Don't get mad at me. You know if you're old, you know if you're young. Amen. To the older people here, you know, you may be in debt. You may be in debt. What does the Bible say? Stop. This, you know, there are people all the time who, or, who, who get confronted with the truth of the word of God and the Bible hits them right in the face and they have the option to continue digging deeper or to start filling in that hole. To get out. Amen. And God says, you know what? I'll help you. Turn to me and I'll help you get out of that. Listen, if you're older today and you found yourself and you find yourself and you are in debt and you've got, you, you've put yourself on the auction block of life and you said, you know, I'll do this for 60 months or I'll do this for 30 years, or I'll do this for 20 years, stop. Start paying off what you owe. Get out of debt so that you can have freedom. I mean, I can't just imagine if I had been born into slavery and I had the option to working and getting out of that, out of that house and out of that slavery into freedom, I would have my mind set and I would be steadfast on getting out of there. So I was free. With God's help, you can get out of debt. And that way, when he calls you, you can drop whatever net you've got in your hands. Amen? Amen? Young people this morning, don't put yourself on the auction block. You're going to look around at all your friends. You're going to look around at maybe your parents, maybe uh, those around you, and they put themselves on the auction block for this or for that. You know, they wanted a nice watch, and they went and bought it. They, they, take, they, they, take, they take all their friends out to the restaurant and pay for everybody. They're like, oh, wow, they're having such a great time. 
And they do this and they do that and they've got a little card and they just swipe it every time. Thinking that the, 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 the bill will never come due. The bill will always come due and Jesus may come calling and you may say, I cannot follow you because I bought something and I'm obligated to my other master. Amen? Young people, don't put yourself on the auction block. Take God at his word and realize if he has given instruction not to owe any man, he will provide for your every need so that you don't have to owe someone and be in debt for whatever it is that you're looking to go after. The thing you have to ask yourself is what I'm looking for, is what I'm pre preparing to buy, is it for the glory of God? A car. If you say, I'm buying a car for the glory of God and you're going deeply into debt, you better read the Bible again. A house is a very wonderful thing. It's a dwelling place, and we all need a house to live in. But let's think about this for a moment. Is it worth the servitude for the house that I'm going after to be in debt and put myself on the auction block for that thing? Knowing that I want freedom. Knowing that you want freedom. These young college kids who found themselves deeply in debt after they signed the contract are calling out saying, please forgive us of our loan. Listen, they signed the contract. They were old enough to know what they were doing. They're in debt for that. If someone generously wants to come up and pay for their debt, that's fine. But it's not free and it costs a lot. Amen. My advice would be don't do it. There's all kinds of options for learning out there today. You don't have to go deeply into debt to learn. You'll learn a lesson if you do. It might be worth more than the money. I don't know. Young people, all I'm saying is don't put yourself in that place. All that Peter had in his hand when Jesus called was a net, and he dropped it and followed Jesus. He loaned God his life. Jesus walked by. He had a net in his hand. Jesus said, follow me. He dropped it. He understood that what he was holding in his hand, his future, his job, wasn't worth holding on to and letting Jesus pass by. Young people, loan God your legs this week. Go where he leads you. Loan God your time this week. Where did it come from? Think about it. Loan God your breath and your voice this week. Where did it come from? Loan God your talents. Where did they come from? Hannah said, listen, I've received a gift from God. How can I hold it back when he wants it from me? I will gladly give it up, knowing that God can do more with this gift than I can. She'd read about Abraham. She knew that Abraham gave up his only son, and, and God gave him a multitude of descendants. If I can trust you, God says, if I can trust you with a little bit, I can trust you with a lot. You read the parable of the talents. Matthew 19, 29, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. I'm going to end with this text kind of this morning. I guess I'm not really going to end, but I'm going to get closer to the end. Luke 14, 18 and 19, our text. And they, with, and they all with one consent began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. This was a parable that Jesus taught the people. This parable contrasts the seemingly rich of this world with the, with the poor of this world. You know, when, when a certain man and a certain king were going to throw a banquet and a wedding, a wedding feast, and he goes out and he invites the people to come in, and they say, well, I can't, because the net they were holding was too important to them. And when the king walked by and the king's servant walked by and said, follow me, they, held, they looked at their hands, and the thing that was in their hands was more important than the call. And they held on to those treasures of this world instead of dropping them and understanding that what they were dropping and what they were giving away was physical 
And God was going to bless them with so much more. Matthew 22, 2 says, And the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. We know what that means. Luke 14, 16. I'm going to read Luke 14, 16 through 24. We've got time. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and shewed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halled and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. How sad it is. You know, how many people were holding on to something? Jesus walked by and said, Follow me. They looked down, they looked up, they looked down, and they said, I can't come. I bought something. I pray you have me excused. Excused? Excused from eternity. Excused from everlasting life. What were they holding? What would, given a, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? If he could gain the whole world and lose his own soul, it wouldn't be worth it. What were they, what were they holding? What had they bought? What had they made themselves a servant to? They borrowed, maybe. They bought something, and it was so important to them. Listen, someone doesn't go out and buy something and, and say, I'll give you 60 months of my life because they don't want it. They don't go out and buy something that, and, and say, I'll give you 20 or 30 years of my life because they don't want it. They want it so badly they're willing to give everything for it, really. Their time in working that job. Being a servant to the rich. It's not worth it. Who followed to the great wedding supper? It wasn't the rich of this world. No, they were holding on to things. I have bought something and I cannot come. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were holding a net. And when Jesus called, they realized nothing in this world is worth holding on to. When Jesus walks by, let go and let yourself become a follower of Jesus Christ. We often think that Jesus only called 12 disciples. No, he called the whole world. But how many are willing to drop what's in their hand? How many are able? How many are able to drop what's in their hands and follow Jesus? You know how the parable ends in Matthew 22, 14? For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, the greatest debt that you can get into is sin debt. If you're not saved this morning, God does offer a free pardon. You know, all, all these young people who, are, who have school debt, they willingly sign their life for however many years it's going to take for that debt. They rightfully own that debt. They rightfully deserve that debt. Now, if someone came along and tore that paper up, there should be gratefulness there. You know what, when we sinned, we gladly signed our name, made ourselves servant to Satan, said, I'll do whatever, because I want this so badly, I'm willing to trample, trample the truth. And we sign up for sin. We take a bite of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. But when Jesus died on the cross, he said, I'm going to take that debt, I'm going to forgive all of it. Think about that. God wants you to be free. John 8, 34 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. God has not called you to be a servant, but to be free. Don't say to Jesus, when he comes and says, Follow me, don't say, I bought something and I cannot come. Look at your hands. Look at your hands. Whatever you're holding, let go and follow Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for... Your word, that's convicting. 
Father, many of us have found ourselves in debt. Uh, we've all been in sin debt, Father, and how wonderful it is that you paid our debt. Lord, help us never to go back to the sin debt. Help us, Lord, just to completely give our life to you. And Lord, when we do sin, you say if we confess our sin, uh, Father, that you're faithful and willing to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we don't want to be a slave to sin. Uh, but Lord, we don't, even in this life, we don't want to be a slave uh, to, uh, to those uh, who, would, who would prevent us. Lord, some people are prevented from coming to church today because they owe money. Some people are prevented from following you into the true calling that you have for them because they owe money. Father, if there are those today who are in debt, help them quickly to get out. And Father, for those young people who've heard this message, Father, help them, Lord, not to follow their friends, not to follow the world, but to let every man be a liar in comparison to God. And Lord, that they'll listen to your word that says, do not owe anyone and be a lender, not a borrower. Lord, just pray, Lord, that you'll bless uh, the invitation. Lord, uh, help us, Lord, just to come and, and uh, lay the things at the altar that shouldn't be in our life. And, Lord, to walk with you. Help us to have true revival in this church and around the world that people could be saved, your kingdom could be attitude, that when your wedding feast takes place, we'll be able to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ask for a song of invitation this morning.